Hi everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about the influence of the Bible in education. Uh, it's important to understand the influence that the Bible has had because this is one of the evidences that the Bible is a divine book. That is, a humanly written book would not be able to have the kind of influence that the Bible has had. It's had a great influence in the world in various fields and education is one of those fields. So in this video, we're going to look at uh, how the uh, Bible influenced or enabled the development of modern education. The followers of the Lord Jesus in the first century were living in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, so the question arises, what kind of education existed in ancient Rome and Greece? We have artifacts like these, and we have the writings of some historians, which tell us that uh, there was some form of tutoring that used to go on. But then it's also important to realize that this education was not for everyone. Only aristocratic boys in Rome used to get education. So education was viewed as something that only elites needed if there was a child whose father was either a king or a senior official in the kingdom, uh, then perhaps he, it was thought that he needed education, not other people. Now, into this world entered biblical Christianity. Now, um, those of us who are familiar with the Bible know that um, the, the first followers of Christ were Jews. And even before uh, the Lord Jesus came to this world, uh, the, the, the Jews had their Old Testament scriptures. And this is a, a verse, uh, a, an instruction that Moses, uh, an ancient leader of the people of Israel, had given them. So he says like this, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the judgments that I speak in your ears this day, that you may learn, guard, and practice them. Do not forget these laws, Teach it to your sons and your sons' sons. So if you read the early part of the Bible, uh, it's called the law. Uh, but strictly speaking, it doesn't just contain laws. It also contains some history. So the, uh, the leaders of the people, like Moses, were trying to communicate to the people of Israel that it is essential for them to know these things. It is essential for them to know God's laws because it will help them have a good life, a wholesome life. And they also need the narrative of God's story to help them make sense of the world. So the first part of the Bible begins with uh, creation, uh, the creation of the universe and uh, how certain things happened in the world, how the world came to be the way it is and so on and so forth. So Moses was telling the people of Israel that it's important for you all to know these things. So um, here we have a, a prototype of education where the people are commanded to teach their own children. Now, the people of Israel did not do a very good job of this. They forgot God's ways. They went against God. They got punished for that also. It took them almost a thousand years to get into this practice of sticking to their basic faith and communicating it to their children. But eventually, they got it. This is a quote from the Talmud, which is a collection of Jewish writings. It was compiled after the time of Christ, but it describes the situation that was there at the time of Christ and just before that time. So it says here that there were 394 courts in Jerusalem corresponding to the number of synagogues and the number of schools and the number of schools for the scribes. So uh, in ancient Israel, because of this biblical instruction, they developed a culture of learning. So the, these very small children would be taught by their own parents, and then every town or village had a synagogue, and the children above the age of six were educated in the synagogue. So schooling or education was an essentially religious practice that developed in the Jewish nation. And the first Christians were Jews and they carried this heritage with them. 
the final parting instruction that the Lord Jesus gave his disciples is called the Great Commission. So Jesus told them that they should go to all nations and teach them the things that he has commanded them. So first of all, they are to teach the good news, that is the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world who has died and risen again. They were supposed to teach that, but they were not supposed to stop at that. They were to teach people who would come to, come to become disciples of Christ all that Jesus had taught his original 12 disciples. So here in this instruction, in this parting instruction that Jesus gave his disciples, we have a mandate for a process of teaching. And sure enough, the early church started practicing this. So as the number of converts or the number of seekers who were interested in knowing what Christianity was all about, as this number increased, uh, the practice of teaching them became more organized. Uh, so there were uh, catechetical schools that developed. So this is a picture of one of those schools at Alexandria. And in these schools, the students or the new converts or the people who were seeking to, the, who were showing interest in Christianity, these people were taught Christian doctrine. But apart from that, they were also taught grammar, mathematics, and medicine. So it was thought that they would be able to understand the Bible better or put their faith to practice better and live better lives if they also knew these uh, little bits of secular knowledge, if they had the secular knowledge apart from the uh, Bible. So this is a comment from William Boyd, uh, one of the historians who's done research on education. And he says that due to these catechetical schools, Christianity became for the first time a definite factor in the culture of the world. So these schools became spheres of influence. One of the most influential figures in the uh, first few centuries after the time of Christ in Europe was Augustine. And Augustine wrote a book called The Doctrina Christiana, that means Christian teaching. So he wrote a book about teaching. And in this book, he says that secular studies will aid students in the interpretation of the Bible. So if you have a good knowledge of history, if you have a good knowledge of grammar, then you will be able to interpret and understand the Bible better. So this was the motivation for, uh, for secular education in the early centuries. Now, when, when Christians started practicing education, they brought about a new practice. So this is a quote from uh, Tatian. He is one of the church fathers from Assyria, and he is addressing secular Greeks here. And he says, we teach everyone, including girls and women. After all, the Lord Jesus said that the gospel should be preached to everybody. So if the gospel is for everybody, then it follows that education also is for everyone. So you will recall how earlier we had seen that in pagan Rome and Greece, education was confined to boys and that too to aristocratic boys. But here it is available to anyone who is interested in the teachings of Jesus Christ. So William Ramsey, another historian, comments like this. He says, Christianity's aim was universal education, not education confined to the rich as among the Greeks and Romans, and it did not make distinctions of sex. So because of Christianity, we see that education in ancient Rome and Greece moved out of the confines of the elites, moved out from being just a male thing, but now spread and became more universal. Now, the, you can understand this process of people coming to Christ like this. Um, as the disciples, the early disciples of Christ would spread the message, uh, spread his message, there would be many people who are interested in knowing about it. So they would be taught. Now, some of these people would choose to become disciples of Christ. And when the next generation comes, the disciples of Christ would definitely be keen that their children would have the same knowledge from a young age. 
and so began the practice of teaching children. So as the medieval ages progressed, there were a number of schools that developed. So this is a painting of King Alfred, one of the famous kings of England, visiting a monastery school. So this is in the ninth century. So during that time, there were schools and these schools were attached to churches and monasteries and children in Europe received some sort of basic education. Now these schools, no doubt these schools decayed over the, over the uh, dark ages, but nevertheless, this was the education that was going on. Now commenting on this education, H.G. Wells, a historian and writer, writes like this. He says, the Catholic Church provided what the Roman Republic had lacked. That is a system of popular teaching, a number of universities and methods of intellectual communication. So, so uh, H.G. Wells is commenting on the education that was there in Europe uh, in the medieval ages and after that. And he says that the church was highly instrumental in it. The church was responsible for education. And before the church, there was the pagan Roman empire and there was no education there. Now, H.G. Wells is not a Christian. He does not have um, uh, a point to prove or he does not have his ideology to support in making this statement. In fact, he goes on to say like this, though the Catholic Church opened up the prospect of the modern educational state in Europe, it is equally certain that the Catholic Church never intended to do anything of the sort. It did not send out knowledge with its blessings. It let it loose inadvertently. So here he says that the Catholic Church ended up uh, pioneering the modern educational state, which is there all over the world. But that was not their intention, he says. They did not want to bless the world. As a secular person, H.G. Wells uh, certainly does not endorse the Catholic Church. And he says they did not intend to send blessing on the world, but they let this blessing loose inadvertently. And this is exactly our point here. If you notice, I did not title this video as the influence of the church or the Catholic church. I titled it as the influence of the Bible. So uh, we don't necessarily endorse the Catholic church or everything that it did. But what we understand from here is that the good things that the Catholic church did, perhaps even inadvertently, they did those things because they were influenced, at least to some extent, by the Bible. The Bible inspired the church to spread education and pioneer the modern educational state. Now, even those of us who are not very familiar with the Bible or the hist hist history of Christianity are probably familiar with Martin Luther. Uh, he is known for starting the Reformation in Europe about 500 years ago. So during the medieval ages, education existed, but it was not flourishing very well. But with Martin Luther, certain changes came. First of all, uh, Luther uh, took a stand for education. He said education is needed because people need to understand both the word of scripture and the nature of the world in which the word would take root. So he says that education is needed because people need to read the Bible. People need to read and understand the Bible. That's why education is needed. And when we teach them, it's not enough just to read the Bible to them, but we also need to teach them something about the world because the Bible, after all, is God's message to man. It speaks about this world. It speaks about why the world is the way it is, how to make sense of the world and so on. So if we have some understanding of the world, then that will enhance our understanding of the Bible. So that's why Luther said education is very important. Uh, William Boyd, the historian, says about him, he wanted a system of education as free and unrestricted as the gospel he preached and indifferent like the gospel to distinctions of sex or of social class. So here you can see that people need to get educated to read the Bible. But who needs to read the Bible? Well, the Bible is addressed for everyone. The gospel is for all, for rich and poor, for boys, for girls, for men and women. So Luther 
uh, endorsed universal education because he uh, endorsed a universal gospel, and he got that from the Bible. Uh, Luther also said that it is the duty of the government to compel its subjects to keep their children in school. So Luther saw that uh, not all parents were motivated to send their children to school, and perhaps that would have an adverse effect on the children. So he said that uh, the government should uh, make it compulsory for uh, children to be sent to school. And he also advocated government funding for schools. Now, we, uh, every one of us may not agree with all these policies about you know, how involved the government should be with education and so on. But the point here is that Luther wanted the government to be involved so that everyone could be educated. And he wanted everyone to be educated because he believed that everyone needs to read the Bible. And this shows the profound influence that the Bible has had on education. Now, these, uh, who were Luther's friends? Uh, the intellectual heavyweight behind Martin Luther's actions was Philip Melanchthon. So he was called the church's teacher. So although he was not hands-on involved in uh, the starting of schools or colleges, uh, he was very much behind the scenes involved in education because he was a master of theology. He understood many subjects and he was a very knowledgeable person and he would have mentored the people who started the first modern schools and colleges in Germany. There was another person called Johannes Sturm, again, one of the churchmen from uh, in Luther's church, and he introduced the concept of graded education. So today we have 12 grades, and after that we have college and university. Well, where did it all begin? It began in the Lutheran church. This is Johannes Bugenhagen, a Lutheran pastor. And uh, he was, he is called the father of the Deutsche Volksschule, that is the German public school. So uh, Luther wanted uh, the whole population of Germany to be educated. Of course, he was involved in so many things because he was the leader of the Reformation. So uh, these are some of the people who implemented his ideas. All of them were believers in Jesus Christ, all of them were motivated by the Bible. It is their devotion to Christ or devotion or commitment to the Bible that motivated them to do the pioneering things that they did for education. Well, before 12th grades, we have kindergarten. Kindergarten has not existed since the very beginning. It started at a definite point of time. The person who started it was Frederick Frobel, another Lutheran. And uh, he writes like this. He says, let us protect our children. Let us steer them away from the harmful chase after material things and the damaging passion for distractions. Let us educate them to stand with their feet rooted in God's earth, but with their heads reaching even into heaven, there to behold truth. So, Kindergarten was started by a man who believed he was doing it because he wanted children to start seeking God from a young age. So he said that, um, you know, if children are just left on their own, then it's possible for them to get distracted. It's possible for them to become indisciplined and this will adversely affect their lives. So we want to guide children properly and the right way to guide children is to, to, to encourage them to seek God. And that was the purpose for starting uh, kindergarten. So uh, a good and teller, two authors in their book called The History of Western Education, they say like this, that Frederick uh, Frobel's motivation was that the world of man and nature are connected by God and children need to learn that at a young age. How do you relate to the world outside in order to relate to the world outside, you need to first properly relate to God. And, and this was uh, Frobel's conviction, and that's why he started kindergarten. This is uh, Jan Comenius or Jan Komensky. Komensky. Uh, the, this is a currency note that uh, commemorates and honors him. 
So he, uh, he lived in Bohemia around uh, 500 years ago, uh, what is today the Czech Republic. He was a church leader of the Czech Brethren, and uh, he was also a pioneer in education. This is taken from the New World Encyclopedia. So uh, the source calls him a teacher, a scientist, an educator, and writer. He was a Moravian Protestant bishop and also a religious refugee and one of the earliest champions of universal education. So he is called the father of modern education. Now, he was primarily a church leader. He was a pastor. But uh, because he saw the way in which the Bible can be can be taught to people and people need to learn the Bible because of this concern, he also became a pioneer of education. So people did not invent modern education just because they thought of it in isolation. It was just a byproduct of the devotion and concern that people had for the Bible and the spreading of its teachings. Um, almost everything, every point that uh, Jan Cominius made about education, about teaching people, was accompanied by a quote from the Bible. So this is a prayer of his that has been recorded. Have mercy, O Lord, on your heritage. Uh, this is in his brief proposal on the renewal of schools in Bohemia. So all the reform of the medieval schools that Jan Communist was attempting, he was doing it uh, as part of his devotion to God. Uh, these are some of the influences that he had. Uh, he was influential in the starting of the Royal Society of Science in England. Hall University was the first modern university in Germany. Uh, later on, it was merged with the Wittenberg University that Martin Luther started. So uh, Jean Comenius was influential in the starting of this university. And uh, he also inspired the Puritans. In fact, the Puritans of America... Uh, invited Jan Cominius to take over Harvard University, which was a college that they had just recently started. And they started it in order to train people to teach God's word. So this is a quote from a secular historian, George Marston. He writes like this, one of the remarkable facts of American history is that only six years after their settlement in the Massachusetts wilderness, the Puritans established what soon became a reputable college. Higher education was for them a priority in civilizational building. So, of course, the Puritans who went to America, they were trying to start a new civilization there. And there have been many civilizations in the past before that, before them. But these civilizations in the past did not give a priority to education. But these Puritans did. Why? Because they were concerned about the spread of the teachings of the Bible. They were concerned that all the settlers who came to this new place, that is America, needed to be taught God's word. The children needed to be taught. The churches needed to be taught. And that's why they set up Harvard University to teach the Bible and also other subjects. Now, in this context, it's uh, worth noting uh, the word university. The word university means unity in diversity. There are many subjects taught in, an, in the university, so that's the diversity, but it's the unity cup. The people who started the first universities, they were motivated by the Bible, and they believed that it is theology that unifies everything. Everything, all subjects, whether it's history, science, art, mathematics, uh, technology, or any, any subject, everything, the, the whole system of knowledge about the world, it all is tied together and pivoted in theology. Uh, the world works or the world makes sense because of God, because of what God has told us about the world. That's why they coined the word university. Another leader of the Reformation was John Calvin, and he was based in Geneva in Switzerland, and he had a plan for the city, and that plan included a system of elementary education in the vernacular for all, including reading, writing, arithmetic, etc., and religion, and the establishment of secondary schools 
for the purpose of training civil and church leaders. So everywhere the reformation had its impact, it led to the blossoming of education. The reformation was an attempt to return to the Bible. And when people returned to the Bible, it had a positive effect on education. Now, why did the reformers, why did the early Protestants lay so much stress on education? So here's the answer from a historian, uh, Gabriel Compire, writing about the history of education. And he says like this, the teaching that each man is responsible for his own salvation logically led to the conclusion that everyone needed to be educated. Now, this is a profound statement. Uh, the Bible teaches that uh, salvation does not come just because you go through a certain set of rituals. Uh, it does not come because you just do a few good deeds, like you go here or you give some money to somebody or something like that. Uh, the Bible does not teach that salvation comes because you are part of a certain community or a certain institution. Instead, the Bible teaches that you will be saved if you understand and accept and respond to the universal truth about this world. The universal truth that this world has been created by a holy God and we all have offended this God and this God himself has come down in the person of Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for our sins and he is the one who died and rose again from the dead if you believe all these things if you put your trust in jesus christ and if you decide to surrender your life to him then you will be saved now this is the message of the bible now needless to say the bible teaches that salvation requires that people understand these things well this this message can be said in a few words but people might have questions People need to understand this message properly. So the Bible provides a lot of details. So people need to know how to read the Bible and understand it so that they can respond to this message and be saved and fulfill the purpose for which they've been created. So here you see how the Bible directly provided a motivation for the establishment of education. Well, what about the people who don't have the the privileges that we have. All of us are endowed with natural abilities, but not everyone has the same abilities. Um, in the ancient pagan civilizations, people who had a handicap were not treated well. But this was a Catholic priest, Abbe Charles Michael de Lepi. Uh, he is called the father of the deaf. So he invented sign language and he was motivated by a desire for deaf people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So today deaf people benefit so much from sign language and you know, perhaps different governments in various countries of the world would have some initiative to educate the deaf people, but it all began. Sign language is invented because somebody was concerned that deaf people also need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. There was a person called Thomas uh, Gallaudet, and he was a Protestant pastor, and he brought this sign language to America. And there he opened the first school of the deaf. Uh, later on, he went on to start a university. And uh, as he was leaving from America to go to Europe, uh, this is what he told his people there. When I come back from Europe, I hope to teach you much about the Bible, about God and Christ. So here you see the pioneer for education among the deaf in America was a, a pastor, a church leader who was motivated by, by this concern that his people, including the deaf people in his church or in his locality, need to hear about the love that Jesus has for them. What about the blind? In ancient times, blind infants were killed. I mean, they were, they were exposed to the elements of nature and left to die. If that was not done to them, if they survived their infancy, then uh, if they were boys, then they were made as galley slaves. 
So you can imagine in the days when ships did not have engines, it was these slaves who would continuously be rowing uh, these ships. Blind girls were made into prostitutes. What else could they do? That was the thought in paganism. But during the Middle Ages, uh, Christians ran asylums, protection centers for the blind, so that they would not be mistreated by others. And they tried to teach these blind children uh, by using raised letters on wax and wood. So it was very difficult. Uh, it was not easy for them to do it. But nevertheless, they tried to teach these children at least uh, how to uh, feel and understand letters and words. Now, there was a person called Louis Braille, and he lost his eyesight at a very young age because of an accident in his father's workshop. So you can imagine it's a horrible thing to happen for a person. If this kind of event would happen to us, perhaps there are most, most of us would grow up with bitterness and sadness at what life has uh, has given us or what has happened in our lives. But as a teenager, uh, Louis Braille went to church and he became an organist there and he really enjoyed playing the organ. And he went on to develop the Braille language, which is a special language for blind people to read. Now, this is what he says. I'm convinced that my mission is finished on Dart. I tasted yesterday the supreme delight. God condescended to brighten my eyes with the splendor of eternal hope. So here he's talking about his own salvation. That is, he believes that because of what Jesus has done for him, uh, he is going to have an eternal life. So that's a hope for him. And this also inspired him to do something constructive instead of moaning and complaining about his misfortune. So this is the effect that the Bible has on a person. I mean, just imagine what Louis Braille would do if he was just another person, and not, um, if, if, if there was no Christianity in his life and he just underwent this misfortune. What would his attitude be? Well, the change is evident when you see the person's uh, devotion to the Bible. It is his devotion to the Bible that made him convinced that God has something good for him and that enabled him to share that goodness with others. The world has been changed since then. Many of us perhaps are aware that uh, in the Industrial Revolution in England, uh, there was a lot of child labor that was used. And um, at this time, this is the 19th century, there were schools in England. But what do you expect poor people to do? Uh, poor people would want their uh, children to earn money rather than to go to school. They couldn't spare that resource. So instead of sending their children to school, poor, poor people would make their children work in the factories. And these children would work very long hours on six days a week. And they uh, would often get into crime because there was no one to love them, no one to care for them and nurture them. These children would get into crime. And as they grew up, they would get into more serious crime and then many of them would land up in jail and it was very difficult to handle them. Now, there was one person who looked at what was happening and he said, vice can be better prevented than cured. In other words, we should do something for these children and straighten them out when they are young rather than wait for them to get adults, get themselves into trouble and then try to straighten them out. This person was for Robert Rakes. So what was his solution to the problem? He found it something that perhaps most people who have been to church would know today. It's called Sunday school. So he started the first Sunday school in 1780. So remember, these children were working in the factories for six days a week. So Sunday was the only day they were free. So he called these children on Sundays and he taught them. So he actually wanted to teach them the Bible. But of course, for that, he first had to teach them how to read and thus began their education. So he went on to establish uh, many Sunday schools in different places in England. This is a picture of one of the early Sunday schools. And he died in 1811. 
20 years after his death, you know, the movement spread and 25% of British children were attending Sunday schools. So you can understand that because of him, um, uh, Britain was on course to becoming a literate nation. Here you see one man's concern. First of all, why should anyone feel sympathetic for poor children? It's his love for Jesus that motivated that. And how can we help children? How can we prevent children who do not have a proper family background from going astray? Well, the Bible was the answer for Robert Riggs. Uh, most of what we said uh, up till now was about uh, schools. Let's have a brief look at higher education. Uh, these are ruins at the Greek city of uh, Thales. Uh, it was the, uh, sorry, the Greek city at Miletus, which was the home of Thales, who was known as the first Greek philosopher. Now, he and other philosophers established some schools, that is, centers of higher learning, but Although these schools were there, they were, not, they were not permanent institutions. They just relied on the individual initiative. If there's one philosopher and he's a little influential or he's, uh, he comes across as convincing, then he would gather a few fans and then they would learn under him. Uh, there were no permanent libraries that were established. There were no scholarly guilds, you know, no society of scientists or no society of historians or anything came out of these schools. So the Greeks had some sort of higher learning, but nothing much came out of it. In fact, uh, these schools died a natural death when the Greeks lost their faith and rationality and gave into mysticism um, in the form of Gnosticism and other movements. But while the Greek system of higher education died, something else was happening in the Christian world. Uh, some Christians who wanted to get away from the world uh, went away from the regular population and they established monasteries. Monasteries would grow their own crops and they would spend the rest of the day praying and also writing and copying and learning. So this is uh, Benedict of Nursia responsible for uh, establishing one set of monasteries and he's called today the godfather of libraries because his monasteries had huge libraries and uh, the, the people who lived there would copy them out and they would also do research on the text. So that text would be the Bible, books by other ancient Christian authors and also the classics of Greek civilization. So monasteries became a center of learning and then the modern university grew out of the monastery. So the first modern university in the world was the University of Bologna. And the purpose for which it was established uh, was the teaching of church law. So here again, you see that it is Christianity that uh, influenced or pioneered higher education. Although this university was initially started to teach church law. Later on, other things also were taught. Uh, dissections of human bodies, which is a routine thing today in medical studies. It began in Bologna in the year 1300. So that's where we get our modern education, modern uh, medical education that we have today. If you look at the, some of the famous universities that were today, you find that um, many of them were established by Christians who wanted to teach uh, people the Bible. So for example, Harvard was started by Congregationalists and Yale and uh, Princeton was started by the Presbyterians and so on and so forth. In Europe, before these American uh, universities in Europe, Oxford, the University of Paris, Cambridge, Basel, Heidelberg, all these places grew out of the church. They were initially, they were started to train church leaders and teachers of the Bible. So a historian comments like this, he says, every college at institution founded in America prior to the Revolutionary War, except the University of Pennsylvania had 
Christian roots. There are two other authors who have written a book called What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? And they say like this, every school you see, public or private, religious or secular, is a visible reminder of the religion of Jesus Christ. So is every college or university. So uh, here you see uh, a summary of the influence of the Bible in education. We began by seeing how uh, it is the gospel, it is the great commission of Jesus Christ that motivated Christians. And that's why they began uh, schools to teach seekers and converts and modern education grew out of that. The profound influence of the Bible in education is one of the many evidences that this book's origin is not just human, but it is a divine book. Thank you very much.